Prosecutors also said Franchese was not considered by the government to, to be, be a cooperating, cooperating witness. witness. That's why he's alive. <laughs> I mean, Michael was up there in the leadership of the, of the, of the uh, Colombo crime family, and he was a huge earner, and he had the ability to give us all sorts of very significant people. He goes, Chicky, he goes, well, who did he really hurt? Michael, that is, Michael, who did he really hurt? Frankie Camp at the ball field said Michael didn't hurt anybody. Now, let me give you a little bit more information to support what I just told you about this one-year deal and about the fact that I didn't give them anything. The Gotti Wars was written by John Gleason. Who is John Gleason? And this book just came out, I believe, in the last year. John Gleason, there he is. He's had a distinguished career as a federal prosecutor, federal judge, presiding at more than 200 trials and practicing defense attorney. He was a lead prosecutor in the successful racketeering murder trials of John Gotti and Vic Arena, one of my guys, respectively, the bosses of the Gambino and Colombo crime families, for which he received the Attorney General's Award for Distinguished Service. He currently teaches at New York University School of Law, Harvard School of Law, and Yale Law School, and lives in New York City with his family. John Gleason. He was the lead prosecutor in the Gotti case. He was the one that Sammy was involved in. Blah. Okay? Now, let me read excerpts from his book, The Gotti Wars, with respect to the deal that I had with the government, okay? There's a couple of pages here that mention me. I'm not cherry picking, you can read it all, I have, but I just don't wanna bore you with everything. But let me read what I think is pertinent here. This is in reference to the deal that I had with the government that I just spoke about. Sammy is willing to cooperate, meaning Sammy Guarano, because this is about the Gotti case. He's willing to testify at the trial, but he wants to meet you first and he wants immunity. He also wants a one-year limit on cooperating like Michael Franzi Scott, and he said he won't testify against his friends. Let me, do Let me go there. The so-called Michael Franzi Memorial Cinderella Clause, I'm sure this is gonna be posted, was even less likely to come Gravano's way. Franzi was a young, handsome, college-educated captain in the Colombo family. He'd gotten jammed up in the late 1980s on a gasoline excise tax scam. Franzis was prosecuted by the Brooklyn Strike Force in 1989 in its waning days before it was merged into the United States Attorney's Office. That's incorrect when he says 1989. I was prosecuted in 1985, but that's his mistake. Verify it. You can look at it. I'm correct in this one. In its waning days before it was merged into the United States Attorney's Office. That was the year, 89, that the Strike Force fell apart. That's what he probably meant here. Except for Laura Ward and Pat Cotter, the members of that office had one foot out the door when Franzese offered to cooperate. And by the way, the offer to cooperate came down exactly like I just explained. They came to me asking me to cooperate. I didn't offer. They made a deal that only a prosecutor about to leave government service would make. Franzese agreed to testify, but only in cases that were indicted within one year of his agreement. Listen to this. From the point of view of a cooperating witness, especially a gangster, the one-year limit made all the sense in the world. It meant Franzese's obligation was finite and short-lived. Since the law required the court to bring indicted cases to trial within a matter of months, he could expect to be finished testifying and to begin his new life in about 18 months. That's what he said. So, what he's saying here, basically, is that this is not a good deal for the prosecution. Not at all. But the fact that they knew they had one foot out the door and they wanted to get something out of me because it was a little embarrassing for New York that I had testified in a case in Chicago and they said this guy put himself on the line in Chicago when he was a guy that we prosecuted and we couldn't get anything out of him. There was a little embarrassment there. That's what I was told, and I kind of get it if you understand the government, okay? So they wanted to get something out of me. So we make the one-year deal, 
Remember, I got inside information, they were falling apart, and all I had to do was be my manipulating way that I was able to do and not give them anything. Okay, listen to this. If there was a silver lining to the ill-advised bargain struck with Franzis, it was that he didn't give up much information anyway. Do you hear that? He didn't give up much information anyway, consistent with what I just told you. Although he'd risen to the rank of captain, they knew that, he claimed not to have been involved in any murders. Did I know about murders? What do you think? I was a captain in the family. What do you think? I was there 15 years, since the early 70s. What do you think? When I took over the organized crime section in January of 1990, Franzis' window of obligation was closing fast. I read all the debriefing reports and found only one plausible case. I want you to listen to what John Gleason said. I read all the debriefing reports and found only one plausible case. One Orange Tut had violated the juror's oath of secrecy by telling his girlfriend when they'd indict, and the girlfriend then got a few dollars of the information. There didn't appear to be any harm done. Franzis was tipped off about the date. He didn't become a fugitive. He didn't try to tamper with witnesses. Or as far as we knew, he didn't hide assets that he thought might be forfeited. So with this information, I did nothing. I did nothing, absolutely nothing. But still, it was a violation of the law to leak grand jury secrets for money. So they brought me in. Did I get the information? Yes. Did I in any way do anything with it to uh, compromise the outcome of the investigation? No. And that's what I said on the witness stand. Yeah, I heard about it, but I didn't do anything with it. So your investigation still went wherever it went. I didn't do anything. And they backed that up through their investigation. He's saying it right here. I did nothing with the information. So what? He gave it to me. I didn't care. Maybe I didn't even believe him at the time. Okay? As the new chief of organized crime and as to the heir of Franzis' agreement, I was determined to get something from the deal because he had gotten nothing. So I assigned the Tut prosecution to Joanne Navix and helped her try the case. Thankfully, it was assigned to a judge who sat in the Long Island courthouse. In the relative obscurity of Uniondale out in Nassau County, we called a Colombo captain to testify against Tut an unemployed janitor who couldn't even afford to retain counsel. Poor Tut got convicted, but the entire affair was embarrassing because, listen to this, please. Franzis had taken my predecessor to the cleaners. Those were his words. Now, is that consistent with what I just told you? That's a federal prosecutor who was on the case, who said he looked at everything that I told him, and there was only one plausible case. And in the case, when I testified in the grand jury, I told them I might have gotten information, but I did nothing with it, nothing whatsoever. I didn't try to hide. I didn't try to do anything. I didn't try to get to the jurors. And that's exactly what I said. So unfortunately, yes, this person got convicted. I don't know if there was anybody else that testified. I assume his girlfriend did because she said she got money for it. I don't know. Now, let me explain something to you. I'm not trying to whitewash it. I absolutely did testify in that case. Okay, but I gave you the circumstances and I told you what I said, supported by what this prosecutor said. Now, I want to take it a step further. Okay, Ed McDonald had said some other things about this, and I want to put that in right now. I want you to hear what Ed McDonald said about what I could have done. Anton Volucas, he called me up and, you know, said, hey, congratulations. You, know, you did a great job in convicting Michael Francis, but he's cooperating with us. And, you know, we're going to come into New York and we're going to support his motion for a reduced sentence. And I said, no, you know, I, I, you're going to be completely nuts. Well, you know, Norby Walt is dumb gutted. You know, he's able to give up Carmine Persico. And he probably sat down with Gotti and, and, and Fat Tony Salerno and, and, and Chin Giganti. I mean, Michael was up there in the leadership of the, of the the uh, Colombo crime family, and he was a huge earner, and he had the ability to give us all sorts of very significant people. Because I want to emphasize this now again. You see what Ed McDonald said? I could have buried a lot of people. Of course I could. I was, I don't have to repeat it. He said who I was in that life, okay? Contrary to what a lot of other people might say, and you know, I'm only my father's son and all that, and all that stuff, okay? I could have hurt a lot of people, but I am supported here 
okay, but both by Ed McDonald and by John Gleason. Now, let me take this one step further. It was said that I put Frankie Campione in jail. How? I didn't testify against him, but they claimed that information that I provided might have caused him to take a plea. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Let me tell you what for happened with Frankie Campione. He had three cases subsequent to my going to jail. Three cases. He got a sweetheart deal. He wrapped up all three individual cases and got a three-year sentence. And none of it was because of me. It was a smart thing to do. First of all, Frankie Campione wasn't an earner. I knew Frankie very well. I put him in business, in the gas business, with my brother. Okay? He drove for my father at the time, and for me every once in a while. Okay? He made a great deal for himself. He had three separate cases. He wrapped them all up. I testified or I gave information on three cases. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. There's no evidence to that. There's no proof to that because it's not true. Absolutely not true. Now, let me support that by some more evidence, which I talked about two years ago, okay, in a video, but nobody paid attention to that. Hold on a minute. I'm going to add something else to that. To Frankie Camp, if I was Sonny, I would get my son over here, Michael, and I would kill him. I would kill him. All right, your son's a rat. And if you ain't going to do it, get somebody else to do it. I remember clear as day. Now, Frank Campione took a little lighter view of that. He said, well, he goes, Chicky, he goes, well, who did he really hurt? Michael, that is, Michael, who did he really hurt? And so, Ch and uh, Chicky said, I don't care. You kill your son. Specifically, I remember those three. Kill your son. Frankie Camp at the ball field said Michael didn't hurt anybody. Okay, you heard it? That was the FBI agent, okay, that was uh, telling Frankie Campione that was involved in the case. He was also involved with my brother, who people know was a cooperating witness at the time. He had bugs in the baseball field where Frankie Campione and this guy Chicky, who was another mob guy, I don't know if he was made or not, but he was another mob guy, okay, and they were talking. And on the tape, Chicky is saying, kill that rat. Sonny should kill the rat. Kill the rat. Kill the rat. Meaning me. Because I'm, I'm whatever. I left the life and, and everybody thought I was talking to the government, right? And what does Frankie Campione say? This is coming from the FBI agent who listened to the tape. This is Frankie saying this on tape. He said, but wait a second. Who did Michael Franzese hurt? Who did Michael hurt? That's the guy I allegedly gave information on, and because of that, he took a plea. He's the one that's saying, but who did Michael Francis hurt? Because I didn't hurt anybody. That's the thing. Now, somebody might have said that I hurt him after he made that statement. Well, I didn't know he made that statement until I saw the Newsday article. I had no clue that this statement was ever made. I didn't hurt him. It was years later. Years later, he took a plea not based upon anything that I said, and it already had all come out that I was cooperating in their view. It already came out. So to say that I put Frankie Campione in jail is absolutely ridiculous. The FBI agent has it on tape with Frankie's own voice. Now you want to speculate, well, maybe something else happened. You want to try to find dirt in there? Go ahead. But the bottom line is, here's evidence. There's evidence right there. I didn't do anything to put Frankie in jail. He had three cases, and he got a sweetheart deal. He wrapped them all up by doing three years, and on three years, I don't know how much he did. And he was in there, and I'll tell you, he was mad at somebody, his son Michael, and there was some stuff where he talked negative about his son Michael. Maybe people thought it was me. I don't know. I happen to like Frankie Campion, okay? I did. I happen to like him at the time. I don't think he was loyal to my father. I think he jumped ship afterwards, is what I heard. I even think he might have got straightened out. I don't know, after the fact. Okay, but this is all nonsense. This is, this is stuff that I'm giving to you. And again, please, anybody that has information to the contrary, information, facts, not speculation, not, well, maybe Michael did this, and maybe it turned out that way, and maybe it did this. People, refer to this video that I'm making right now, because that's the truth. The way this came down, that's the truth. And at the end of the day, for me, it was important to put nobody in trouble and nobody in jail. I regret the fact that this young man, Tut, who I don't even remember, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, it was so long ago, I don't, I don't hardly, I don't even remember testifying. I did, but I don't remember it. It was that in, inconsequential to me. Because again, 
The way he said, I never did anything with the information. Did I get it? Yes, I did. And when they asked me down on the stand, did you get information? Yes, I did. I don't even remember if he gave it to me, the girlfriend, I don't remember anything about it. It was that long ago and it was that inconsequential. And the only reason they put me on the stand is because he said it. They had nothing else. They tried to salvage something out of the deal just so it wasn't a total waste because I didn't hurt anybody. He would have said, John Gleason here, well, he, he told about other people. He did help us about, you know, other mob guys in other states. That never happened. Never happened. So here it is. Again, call me whatever you want to call me. It's okay. But now you got the facts from me supported by the information that I provided here today. I'm going to leave you with one last thing on this. Okay. Okay. Let's go into one, one other thing. Okay. I did testify in front of the Senate about organized crime uh, involvement in professional boxing. I did. Why? I'm going to send you back to shadow boxing, which was a huge investigation on me and Don King. They had 83 tape recordings on this. They did a whole thing. Go to Sports Illustrated magazine and look at it. So when they brought me in front of the Senate, all I did was talk about exactly what was written in the article. Did anything ever come out of that Senate investigation here? No. Did anything ever come out of the undercover operation they had on me and Don King? No. They couldn't indict us. They couldn't indict anybody. Nothing happened. Why did I testify in front of the Senate? Come on, dog and pony show. Nobody gets indicted, nobody gets arrested, nobody goes to jail because of anything in front of the Senate. And if you don't know that, then you don't know politics, okay? Look what's happening now. There's investigations on, on tons of information. On, on Joe Biden, they can't get anything done. Come on, it was a dog and pony show. Nothing occurred out of it and I knew nothing would happen out of it. So there again, John Gleason would have said, hey, at least we got the Senate stuff out of him. Nothing. He said he looked at all the debriefing and nothing came out of it except for that case with the grand jury. That was it. I rest my case with respect to that. I want to leave you with one last thing. Joe Rogan, who I think my reps didn't reach out to him. Well, hey, I'd love to be on with Joe Rogan. I like his show. I think we'd have a great conversation. He hasn't called me to be on, but he did something on me. 15 minutes or 10 minutes a uh, thing on me. I want you to listen to it. And I want you to listen to it right through the end. It's about two, three, five minutes, whatever it is. Listen to it right to the end. Because at the end of the tape, it says very clearly what you're going to hear now. They contacted me. Really recently, I got a request to have them on. Step, bring them on. Good point. Where's the hundred million? Oh, he's got a hundred million buried somewhere? He looks like a former mob boss. And how did he, how is he out? How much time did he have to do? I don't know, but he did, I know he was in jail, but um, but he wasn't in there for murder. He was in there for some kind of, there was a big gasoline thing in the 80s. Things with the Russian mob, I think he was involved with them. He sold billions of gallons of gas. The family would collect the state and local gas taxes, but keep the money instead. At the same time, they were often selling the gas at lower prices than at legitimate gas stations. In the mid-1980s, Fortune magazine listed Franchese as number 18 on its list of top 50 wealthiest and most powerful gangsters in the world. He was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. So what is he doing now? He's a motivational speaker now. This is how you steal. Prosecutors also said Franchese was not considered by the government to, to be, be a cooperating witness. witness. That's why he's alive. Okay, there you have it. I didn't know Joe Rogan was doing that. He didn't bring me on. I didn't create that. I don't know where he got it from. But what did it say? The federal government does not consider Michael Franzese to be a cooperating witness. One last thing, and I'll wrap this up. I am on parole. It was 1991, I believe. Could be wrong, 90 or 91. I'm on parole. The agents come, and they pick me up, and they take me to Newark, New Jersey. And they say, we're putting you on the stand to testify against John Riggy, my friend, boss of the New Jersey crew. Because he and I had a deal together where we, uh, every window that came into the city, we got a tax on. Why did they know that? I did give a 302 on it, but I knew it couldn't go anywhere the way I gave a 302. And there was a cooperating witness that was involved with us that became an informant. So he filled in the blanks of that 302 and said that I was his partner and he's gonna put me on the stand to testify against him. That night, I refused. I refused to get on the stand. I never took the stand. Check this out. I don't know who the prosecutor was. 
You can look it up for all those that you do your investigation. It was the John Riggi trial. Reach out to the prosecutor, ask him if he had me in there, ask him if I refused to cooperate and they sent me back. And I'll tell you that, from that point on, the government had another vendetta against me. And when they locked me up on a parole violation and put me in the hole for 29 months and seven days, I was told point blank, they're getting even with you, Michael. You screwed them. You didn't do what you said you were going to do. You didn't cooperate. They're getting even with you. You're going to spend your time in solitary. And I spent 29 months and seven days as a result of that. I refused to testify against my friend John Riggi. And you know what? Everybody on the street knew that. Maybe that's one of the other reasons why I'm alive. And there's other reasons too, because there was other people that cooperated that the FBI came to me and wanted me to corroborate and I refused. So they got even with me. That's it, people. I rest my case on this for now. I'm not gonna deal with it again. I'm not gonna bring it up again. But you know, whenever you hear something, you can refer to this. And all I ask is this, if somebody's making accusations, tell them to bring you the evidence, bring you the, not so, you know, speculation, bring it forward. And you can refer to this, and anybody that wants to ask me a question about it, please refer to this video, because I'm not going to deal with this again. This is way in my past, okay? Some people, and there's a lot of sites, I'm not picking out anyone, that love to go over this. And again, I'll leave it at this, call me whatever you want. It's okay. I'm way beyond that, way past that in my life. Call me whatever you want. It's okay. But these are the facts as I laid out to you today. That's it. My friends, how do I always leave you? Same way, not gonna change. Be safe, please be safe, especially through this holiday season. Be healthy, don't eat too much, get to the gym, watch what you eat, it's important. And yes, I mean this, especially through this holiday season. God bless each and every one of you. And yes, I'll see you next time.